Well, it looks like we have a good amount of folks joining us, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation's Lunch and Learn series. Today's program will explore activated P13 kinase delta syndrome, or APDS, with Dr. Evelyn Wu. My name is Emma Mertens and I'm the Program Manager of Community Relations at IDF. On behalf of all of us at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this Lunch and Learn. We are so excited to host this webinar for the IDF community. IDF is committed <clears throat> to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered and offer you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your journey with PI. Today's Lunch and Learn is part of IDF's regular series of bite-sized programming that will provide diagnosis-specific information and support to our community wherever they may be. We'd like to thank Farming for supporting today's program and we'll be hearing from them later on in the presentation. Before we begin, I would like to point out a few housekeeping items to keep in mind for today's Lunch and Learn. This afternoon, we are using the Zoom webinar feature. Attendees should be able to see the slides and our panelists and be able to hear myself and the presenters speak. Attendees will not be able to activate their video camera or their microphone. There will be the opportunity for questions after the presentation, and you're welcome to submit any questions you have for our presenters as you think of them throughout. Please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. Please do not include any personal health information, as all questions will be anonymous and read aloud. A brief disclaimer, please remember that information presented during this forum is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We're here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational forum or event. To learn about IDF and to explore our resources, please visit our website at www.primaryimmune.org. Our website offers a wide variety of online and principal resources for anyone seeking information or support for PI. This includes the Patient and Family Handbook for Primary Immunodeficiency Diseases, which you'll see there on the left. Um, we can also help you find a PI specialist in your area with the Clinician Finder. Visit the IDF Resource Center where you can find all IDF publications, videos, news, and more. And since we're here today to talk about APDS, I also want to draw everyone's attention to IDF's resources specifically for APDS. Um, we do have a website dedicated to APDS. It's primaryimmune.org slash APDS. The website offers information on symptoms um, as well as resources for genetic testing. And it also links out to the All About APDS website, which we will talk about more in a bit. IDF also offers monthly programming and events. In addition to our lunch and learns, we host two IDF forums a month. We also have Get Connected groups, peer support, and Ask IDF. This fall, we hope you'll join us for IDF's largest event of the year, our 2022 Primary Immunodeficiency Conference, taking place on October 6th through the 8th. Registration is now open, and you can register by visiting primaryimmune.org conference. And now I am so pleased to introduce our presenter for today. Dr. Evelyn Wu is the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at UNC Chapel Hill, specializing in pediatric allergy, immunology, and rheumatology. Welcome, Dr. Wu. So I want to thank Emma for that kind introduction and um, also um, I'm really excited about this opportunity and want to thank the IDF for this opportunity to talk all about APDS. And as Emma mentioned, my hope is that um, whether it was APDS or something else that brought you guys here, that you learn, like she said, bite-sized information either about APDS, but perhaps some concepts that can be applicable to um, other immunodeficiencies as well. Briefly, um, Farming Healthcare did support the creation of the content of this presentation, and I do receive consulting fees from Harm Farming Healthcare, um, not related to any material that I will be reviewing today, but I also receive research grants as an investigator um, from these pharmaceutical companies listed here. 
So before we talk about APDS specifically, I thought it would be important to kind of take a step back and take a few moments to talk about primary immunodeficiencies in general. Um, so primary immunodeficiencies are an expanding group of rare inherited genetic disorders with variable manifestations. Um, so you can see here, as of a report that was put out in 2020, over 400 inherited genetic primary immunodeficiencies have been recognized and that list is growing. Um, all of these primary immunodeficiencies share that um, there is a lack, either partial or complete, lack of some function um, that makes the immune system unable to do its job, which is to help fight off infections and eliminate germs from the body, right? So primary immunodeficiencies can present at any age. Certainly severe cases tend to present early in childhood or even in infancy. Um, but something I want to particularly emphasize is, again, that variable clinical presentation that primary immunodeficiencies can have. Um, so typically we think of, again, because of that lack of something important in our immune system, that deficiency, we usually think of primary immunodeficiencies presenting with an increased risk of routine or severe infections, right? But something that we are increasingly appreciating is that the immune system is all about checks and balances. And so whenever there's a partial or complete lack or there's a loss of one of those checks and balances, you can also have an overactive immune system that can manifest as autoimmune or autoinflammatory complications. And this subset of primary immunodeficiencies are, is called primary immune regulatory disorders. So these primary immune regulatory disorders can present, present not only with immunodeficiency or that increased risk for infections, but they can present with what we call immune mediated pathology that is part of that overactive immune system. And those can be divided into autoimmune conditions, autoinflammation, and something we will talk later about in the context of APDS, which is um, lymphoproliferation. So the takeaway here is that these kind of immune mediated pathology can affect any organ, okay? So you see here the skin, um, the musculoskeletal system, so the muscles and the joints, um, the neurological system or the brain, the endocrine or the glands and so on. In other words, any organ in our body is essentially fair game. So what did bring us all here for this Lunch and Learn is activated PI3 kinase delta syndrome or APDS, which happens to be an example of a primary immune regulatory disorder. So APDS was first discovered in 2013. Um, currently, is it, it is estimated to affect about one to two people per 1 million persons. But 2013 is actually relatively recent in science and medicine. So we are still learning a lot about APDS and are trying to increase awareness about the disease. As of right now, we think that APDS is caused by variants or changes in one of two genes, either PIK3CD, which results in APDS type one, or a gene PIK3R1, which results in APDS type two. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next section. Um, we'll also talk about how these variants or changes in either one of these genes cause the immune system to not work properly and therefore the symptoms of what we see with APDS. So what causes APDS? Um, you know, again, I thought it would be important before we talk about what goes wrong in APDS, we have to understand what is right. And so the immune system has multiple compartments. It's almost like an orchestra consisting of different instruments. They all have to work together or in concert to do their job. And so the immune system has many different compartments that have to work together to do its job to protect our body from infections and germs. Two of those major compartments are your T cells and your B cells. And I know an immunologist who likes to um, compare some of these compartments of the immune system to you know, different um, sections or personnel in the military. And so the T cells are kind of like your generals, right? They're very high ranking. So they tend to regulate other compartments in your immune system, but when necessary, they are ready to do the dirty work and destroy the specific germs. 
your B cells are kind of like your um, um, like your Air Force. So they will deploy missiles or what we call antibodies. You can see here these antibodies are these Y-shaped proteins or missiles out into the body to target and destroy um, specific germs. Now, another important thing is the immune system abides by the Goldilocks rule. You remember Goldilocks and the three bears? So too much or too little of T and B cell activity equally can cause problems, right? So everything needs to be just right in order for T and B cells to do their job. So um, moving, um, so in addition, B and T cells are a lot like humans, okay? So we don't go out into this world um, until we become mature functioning adults, at least most of us don't. So similarly, B and T cells must follow specific steps to mature in order to become functional and do their job. And they do that through a series of specific steps or stages of growth and maturation, right? So if we were to look at B cells specifically, you can see you're starting out with a newborn B cell in the bone marrow, and it goes through different stages of development before it gets put out into the body or into the world as a mature functional cell, where it can then do its job in response to germs. Not much different than humans, B cells have a life cycle, right? And what that means is while new B cells are being born, um, there are B cells undergoing um, death. And so what that means is the B cell compartment is relatively stable. And so typically there should be around the same types and numbers of B cells um, throughout our life. Now, if you were to crack open one of these B or T cells like a nut and look on the inside, what you would see is that there are pathways that instruct how these um, B cells and T cells should mature. Um, and so in order to become functional, they have to follow these specific pathways, um, again, to grow and develop and to mature and functional B and T cells. It's not much different than the pathways that we see here, like in this machine, right? So there's a series of very um, intricate events, a cascade of events that ultimately at the end, produce some effect that instruct the B and T cells um, how to mature and function. So the PI3 kinase delta pathway, which is important in APDS since it's in its name, is a very important pathway in B and T cells um, in their instruction on how to mature and function. So if you were to look again at that same machine, to me, the PI3 kinase delta protein is almost like the lever at the beginning of the machine, right? It can kind of um, alternate between the on position, accelerating the cascade of events in this machine, or into the off position, trying to slow down the cascade of events in this machine. Again, the Goldilocks rule applies here, okay? So this PI3 kinase delta pathway activity has to be tightly balanced in order to balance, um, you know, the growth and development of immature cells into mature and functional B and T cells, okay? So what happens in the context of APDS is that the PI3 kinase delta activity is overactive. So you can see here that the PI3 kinase delta lever is essentially just stuck in the on position, constantly accelerating this cascade of events. And this is where the Goldilocks rule is broken. So and when you have unbalanced PI3 kinase delta pathway activity, you have the skewing or unbalance of the growth and maturation. And so instead you have a host of more immature B and T cells and less functional mature cells that can do their job, which is to help fight infections and also maintain balance in our immune system, right? If you were to put a magnifying glass onto this PI3 kinase delta protein, what you would see is that it consists of two building blocks. Um, so to me, there's this P110 delta building block, which is also called the catalytic um, building block, or what I like to think of as sort of the gas pedal for the PI3 kinase lever. And then there's the P85 alpha building block, which is the regulatory building block, which to me is like the brakes of um, the lever, and we'll get to that on the next slide. So if you are someone who has a variant or change in the PIK3CD gene, okay, you have um, a variant in that catalytic 
or gas pedal unit, okay? That causes the gas pedal to essentially stay in the on position. And this is what causes APDS type one. If you have um, variants or changes in the PIK3CR gene, then you have variants in that regulatory or brake unit. And what happens is those variants or changes do not allow the brake to work the way they are supposed to. And so either way, you have too much gas or acceleration or not enough brake and slowing down, um, either results in PI3 kinase delta hyperactivity and therefore APDS. Um, so taking a further step or looking at further, again, you have that unbalanced PI3 kinase delta activity, and therefore you have unbalanced development in our T and B cells, which are very important in our immune system. And so you can see, again, there's sort of a skewing towards these immature cells that are going out into our body. And that's much like, again, you're putting, you know, um, like elementary school children in charge of your office. I, I just don't think that's gonna work out well, right? So similar with APDS, what we see when we don't have functional mature cells is that immune deficiency. So increased infections and that immune dysfunction or autoimmune complications, which result in the many symptoms that we see here, which we're gonna talk about in the next section. But before we get to the symptoms of APDS, I think it's really important to remember that APDS is a genetic disorder and therefore can be inherited, right? So if you have, let's say like in this picture, a father who's affected, but also could be a mother, any child they have has a 50% chance of being affected. Um, and for that reason, we do recommend that family members of patients with APDS should undergo genetic testing regardless of symptoms. Because what you see here is that even within a single family, where every single family member it, um, has the exact same genetic change, their APDS can look different. They can have different symptoms. It can be less severe, more severe. So anybody should just get genetically tested. Another important thing is that there are some patients or some families where the APDS variant or change can occur spontaneously in a given person, meaning it doesn't exist in other family members. They are the first one to be affected, but then can subsequently pass it down um, to future generations. So just highlighting the importance um, of the need to get genetic testing. And hopefully as we talk about symptoms and treatment, we'll understand how having a genetic confirmation can really um, potentially change your overall care and management and make a big difference. So what are the symptoms of APDS? Um, you know, from this figure, what I want you guys to take away is that you see here a wide range and a numerous list of manifestations Stations that um, can affect APDS patients. The other takeaway is that it can affect many organs throughout the body. And then we're going to take a deeper dive into the more common manifestations that we see with APDS. So by far the most common and sometimes or usually the initial symptom of APDS um, is recurrent sinopulmonary infections. So you can see here, almost all APDS patients experience or report recurrent sinopulmonary infections. They often start young within the first year of life, sometimes up to 10 years, but on average, they start in infancy. And these include upper respiratory tract or airway infections. So recurrent sinus infections, recurrent otitis media or ear infections, as well as lower respiratory tract or lung infections such as pneumonia and bronchitis. And allergies and asthma are also common amongst APDS patients. When we get concerned or what is of concern here is that these recurrent episodes of infection and inflammation can result in complications and scar. So for example, patients who experience recurrent um, ear infections, they can get hearing loss. And that's gonna be pretty important for a growing child who relies on their hearing for speech development, right? Um, the other is the recurrent episodes of pneumonia or lung infection can result in a type of scarring that we call bronchiectasis. And there are some patients who have even needed portions of their lung tissue resected um, because of that scar or because it's not working well or because it's so badly infected, it's not responding to treatment. 
Um, patients with APDS are also at high risk or particularly vulnerable to um, infections with the family of viruses called herpes viruses. You can see here 36 to 49 percent of APDS patients report either an acute or sometimes chronic viral infection at some point in their disease course. Um, about a third report infection with EBV or Epstein-Barr virus. That's the virus that's responsible for mono. Um, you can also have infections with a cousin or relative to EBV, which is called CMV or cytomegalovirus. And the way that that presents is several different ways. And so it could be viremia, which just means that you have blood um, you have virus circulating in your bloodstream. So if I were to do a blood test, I could detect that virus in your blood test. Sometimes, however, that virus disseminates. So it pops out of the bloodstream and then infects other organs like the brain and can cause a type of infection called encephalitis. It can also infect your lymph nodes and cause a type of infection called lymphadenitis. And something that's a particular concern in patients with APDS is having that kind of chronic EBV or monovirus can actually increase or sometimes drive a risk for a certain type of cancer called lymphoma. And for that reason, I'm a big believer that any patient who has unexplained herpes viral infections should be tested for immunodeficiency, including um, APDS. So moving on from kind of the immune deficiency and increased risk for infections, we're next gonna kind of talk about the spectrum of immune dysregulation features or symptoms that patients with APDS can have. Lymphoproliferation is something that's really important. So our lymphatic systems, we all have them, they can of the lymph nodes and then tiny tubes that collect all the lymph nodes throughout the body. They are a very important part of our immune system. Um, in addition to consisting of lymph nodes, it also includes our spleen and hepatic is our, our fancy word for liver. So both the spleen and liver are an important part of our lymphatic system. So when we have lymphoproliferation, patients with APDS can have lymphadenopathy or enlarged lymph nodes. They can have mega, mega like a spleen, so enlarged spleen. Um, they can have hepatomegaly, which is an enlarged liver, or they can have this condition that we call nodular lymphoid hyperplasia. And this is when patients have like little islands of lymphoproliferation in their airway tract or their gut tract. And this lymphoproliferation tends to also manifest early on average around three years of age, but again, it can be a range, right? And here are some nice pictures. So this is a type of radiology scan, which is called a PET CT scan. And if you can see here, there are some gray and black areas signifying a child who has all this enlarged lymph nodes in his neck, and then black areas in his abdomen, which would suggest um, enlarged lymph nodes in his belly, in his gut, as well as in his spleen. Um, we'll review this again on the next slide, but if you were to stick a camera down his gut, you would see here, um, usually this, the gut should be pretty smooth. And what you see are, again are these islands of lymphoproliferation. This is that nodular lymphoid hyperplasia that these APDS patients can get. Um, this picture is supposed to signify the enlarged spleen and liver that these patients can get. Um, typically the spleen is tucked up under your left rib cage. And here the marker line shows that this child has a spleen that's enlarged all the way down into his belly and pelvis. Um, similarly, the liver is usually tucked up under your right rib cage, and here you can see with the marker line that the liver edge is well below the edge of the right rib cage, um, indicating an enlarged liver. So um, about 51% of APDS patients also experience GI or gastrointestinal manifestation. That could be bowel inflammation, chronic diarrhea, malabsorption is a concern. So the gut is there to help us absorb nutrients and essential vitamins. And if it can't do that, that can also cause issues. Um, sometimes this GI inflammation is due to that lymphoproliferation that we talked about on the prior slide, right? Um, so if you have a patient where there's concern for um, you know, GI manifestations, it might indicate the need for a scope so that you can look for that nodular lymphoid hyperplasia or those islands of lymphoproliferation like you see here. Um, typically the enteropathy will present at five years of age, but again, it can certainly be a range. Um, patients with APDS may also present with failure to thrive. And what that means is 
They don't grow well or gain weight well. They don't grow in height well. You can see here 45 to 60 percent, um, 62 percent of APDS type 2 patients have failure to thrive at some point in their disease course. APDS type 1 patients get failure to thrive as well. Sometimes it's due to that enteropathy or lymphoproliferation that we talked about on the previous slide, um, but sometimes it's not. And it's really important, you know, to optimize the growth and nutrition of these patients um, because that is also important for our immune system as well. Another very important uh, manifestation for these APDS patients is autoimmune disease, right? And again, it's a manifestation of that immune dysregulation. So what autoimmune means, auto is one owns body and immune system. So autoimmune is your immune system attack on your own body. And autoimmune cytopenias, cytopenias meaning low blood cell lines, are by far the most common autoimmune complications that we see in APDS. So about 30 percent of patients and multiple blood cell lines can be affected. The more common ones are going to be autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That is where the immune system attacks the red blood cells, causing you to be anemic. And the second most common is probably ITP, which is where there's an immune attack on your platelets. Those are the blood cells that help you clot after you get a scratch to stop you from bleeding. So not unexpectedly, these patients can present with easy bleeding, easy bruising, um, or sometimes pinpoint bruises that we call petechiae in the skin. But autoimmunity doesn't just have to affect the blood cell lines. So patients with APDS can have autoimmune complications of their kidneys me, of their skin. Some of them end up in my pediatric rheumatology clinic because of arthritis or other autoimmune conditions like lupus. Um, there can be autoimmune complications of the liver and then the endocrine glands, so autoimmune thyroid disease or autoimmune diabetes or sugar dysregulation. And then neurological deficits, while not as common, can certainly happen and, um, and affect a significant proportion of APDS patients. You see here, 10 to 31%, depending on the type of APDS you have. Um, this can manifest in various ways. It could be developmental delays in a child, speech delays specifically in a child, learning disabilities, um, or a diagnosis of autism anxiety, depression, or other behavioral disorders. And I think this just kind of emphasized the far reaching effects um, that APDS can have. Something of major concern for us to care for patients with ABDS is sometimes that lymphoproliferation that we talk about can progress um, to cancer. Most commonly in patients with APDS, a type of cancer called lymphoma. Sometimes having multiple types of lymphoma is not uncommon. Um, you can see leukemia and solid organ cancers, like just cancer of the kidney or just cancer of the lung, but that is much less frequent than what we see with lymphoma. And you can see here amongst APDS patients, anywhere from 13 to 28% of patients have been affected by lymphoma or cancer. And young, um, the average age is around 18 to 23 years of age. You can see here um, a wide range um, of when patients are affected. The reason why it's a concern is it places a patient with APDS at higher risk of mortality. And so you can see here in this report, when they tracked APDS patients over time, for those patients that passed specifically due to the APDS or complications, um, more than half the time it was due to complications from um, lymphoma. So certainly something important as I care for patients with APDS is that kind of constant surveillance of any um, potential development for lymphoma. Um, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit about variations in blood tests um, that can happen with APDS. And for those of you who do have APDS or other immunodeficiencies, um, you probably recognize some of these blood tests that you either had at the time of your diagnosis or probably more likely blood tests that you had um, during your journey to an APDS diagnosis. Um, and one of those major tests are immunoglobulin levels, right? So those immunoglobulins are those missiles that the B cells um, project um, to, in order to dis destroy germs. And so patients with APDS frequently have um, disturbances in their immunoglobulin levels. Um, probably more than half have low IgG or immunoglobulin G levels. They can be normal. 
Um, some have low to normal IgA levels, and then many, but not all, will have elevated um, or normal IgM levels. And then another hallmark for APDS is patients often have poor immune responses to vaccine challenges. And what that means is that if I were to give you, and some of you have all received as part of routine vaccinations, like tetanus or a pneumonia vaccine, and I test your blood afterwards, oftentimes you see a low response, or sometimes it doesn't even look like you've been vaccinated. So again, poor immune responses um, to vaccinations. Again, a sort of another complex slide, but the takeaway is we're going to go back and revisit those T cells and B cells, okay? Under normal circumstances, ideally, what we want to see is a neutral arrow. But what you can see here in the context of APDS, again, because of that unbalanced PI3 kinase delta activity, you can see up and down arrows. And so you see um, there are a decrease in the amount in certain type of T cells. There's a decrease in the amount in certain type of B cells. These are important cells for our immune system. Um, there are an increase in the certain type of T cells um, and an increase in a certain type of B cells that aren't functional unless the rest of the compartment is intact. But bottom line is all these disturbances in your T and B cell compartments, they underpin all the common symptoms that we typically see as part of APDS that we just reviewed on the prior slides. So for the last section, I'm gonna briefly talk about um, treatment of APDS. And um, many people have heard me use this analogy before, but to me, currently, best on, based on what we have available to us, um, treating APDS is a little bit like a game of whack-a-mole. So you're either trying to treat the symptom as it comes up, or you're trying to prevent the symptom from rearing its head. And treatment for APDS can, to me, sort of be divided into two sections. The first is trying to treat the underlying immune deficiency or the increased risk for infection, and that includes like antibiotic prophylaxis or anti-infection prevention, and then immunoglobulin replacement therapy, and we're going to talk about each of these. And so the, um, you can see here that 61 to 79% of patients have reported being treated with antimicrobial or antibiotic prophylaxis. And some of these antibiotics commonly used are um, Bactrim or Septra and Azithromycin. There are some patients because of those chronic herpes virus infections that I talked about, they need to be on long-term antiviral infections. And then there are some patients um, with APDS who get recurrent or chronic fungal infections, and so they need to be on preventative antifungal medications. Here you see, yes, the antibiotic prophylaxis can certainly be used and help reduce or prevent the infections that we know are so common amongst APDS patients. The limitation, however, is the antibiotics don't address the other arm of APDS, which is that immune dysregulation, right? So the next way we try to prevent infections is that um, immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Um, a majority of individuals with APDS report being treated with immunoglobulin replacement therapy, either administered through an IV in an infusion center um, or subcutaneously, so, so through an infusion just directly under the skin. Um, and similarly, you know, it can be really helpful at, um, especially for individuals who have low immunoglobulins or poor vaccine responses, because it helps reduce the number or frequency of infections and yeah, is overall well tolerated. But again, limitations, it doesn't do a great job of treating herpes viral infections. Um, if we do have scar like bronchiectasis already present, it doesn't necessarily prevent the progression of some complications associated with APDS. And then again, similar to the anti-infective preventative medications, it doesn't um, address the immune dysregulation that we know is so common amongst individuals um, with APDS, which then brings me to the second arm, right? So that's the other half of APDS that we can't ignore because a lot of patients have immune dysregulation. And you can see here several medications that we've deployed for APDS that, you know, might be for other indications because everything I've just talked about is not FDA approved for APDS. So some of you may have been treated with steroids. There's a class of medication called mTOR inhibitors. Probably the most common example for that is serolimus or rapamycin. I'm going to talk a little bit about that on the next slide. 
And then there are other immune suppressing medications that we use based on the autoimmune manifestation that a patient has. But let me just say, this can be worrisome, right? Because we already have a patient who has an underlying immune deficiency and is already at increased risk for infections. And here we are talking about medications that further suppress their immune system because we're trying to treat that underlying immune dysregulation. And this is kind of, you know, follow me through this figure, but you can see here, again, we talked about the immunoglobulin replacement therapy and the anti-infective um, medications that will prevent infections. When it comes to the immune dysregulation, we have the steroids, which can suppress both T and B cells. We have a medication called rituximab. Some of you may have been um, treated with that. That can get rid of or deplete your B cells. We talked about those mTOR inhibitors like serolimus, also known as rapamycin. The reason that this was used for APDS is because if you think back to that hyperactive PI3 kinase delta activity, that increased PI3 kinase delta activity drives a bunch of downstream effects, including increased mTOR activity. So of course it makes sense to try to maybe um, inhibit that mTOR activity or decrease it by using serolimus. However, the takeaway from all this is that none of these treatments I just listed get to the root cause of APDS, which is that PI3 kinase delta hyperactivity. So boy, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had some treatment available to us that normalized that PI3 kinase delta activity that would then treat both the immunodeficiency piece, as well as the immune dysregulation piece um, of APDS and comprehensively treat any patient who has APDS. One solution that we've tried looking at that could be a potential option is stem cell transplant, right? So that's where you give a patient a, a do-over, wipe the slate clean, knock out the immune system that they do have, and try to give them stem cells from a donor who's healthy um, so that those stem cells then can grow up into mature and functional T and B cells or other compartments of our immune system. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about it because it's still, we're still trying to learn more. There was one recent report of about 57 patients with APDS type one and two. And when they looked about two years out, what they saw was that 86% of patients had survived. 86% might sound good, like a B, a score of a B, but that means one out of every seven individual is passing away. And to me, that's one out of seven individuals too many. The other thing is that two years, only 68% of them was the stem cell transplant, um, did it take, was it successful? That means for a third of them, they were still, either the stem cell transplant didn't take, they were needing a second, sometimes even a third stem cell transplant. So the bottom line is when it comes to stem cell transplant, which is not a small procedure, I think we still need to understand and more study is needed you know, what is the APDS, APDS patient that needs a stem cell transplant? And if they do undergo a stem cell transplant, what is the best way to optimize their chances of success? So more study needed as far as stem cell transplant goes, but currently this is the landscape for how we manage um, APDS. So kind of summary points before I get to the last couple of slides. Um, so hopefully um, some takeaways, some bite-sized nuggets from this is that APDS is a rare genetic inherited primary immunodeficiency characterized by immune deficiency as well as immune dysregulation. And so those common manifestations of APDS are gonna be the recurrent respiratory tract infections, infections with that herpes virus family, um, the evidence for immune dysregulation is that lymphoproliferation, a spectrum of autoimmune diseases, as well as lymphoma. And currently, treatment consists of anti-infective prevention, right? So trying to prevent them um, from developing infections with medications, as well as immunoglobulin replacement therapy. And then we need targeted medications for the immune dysregulation and autoimmune features that these patients present with. And last, um, hopefully, you know, something I've been able to emphasize throughout this is that APDS is a genetic disorder. And so, you know, a genetic confirmation can be critically important because um, we talked about all these complications and disease courses that these patients can have. Having a genetic confirmation can certainly impact um, your care and treatment and so would be important to um, obtain. 
If you guys are interested in additional resources, um, Emma outlined some of these early in her introduction. So if you're looking for information on primary immunodeficiencies, certainly the IDF has a wealth of resources as well as some of these other foundation and consortiums here. If you're looking on more information about genetic testing and genetic diseases and what all that involves and entails, um, there's a company called Gene Matters. And then if you want additional information on APDS, like Emma outlined at the beginning, there's an all about APDS website. And there's also um, a YouTube page. So you guys can learn all about APDS um, to your heart's content. One resource that I particularly wanted to point out is something called Navigate APDS. And so, as I mentioned before, genetic testing can change how you are cared for and treated. And so what Navigate APDS is, it is a no charge um, genetic program that is offered for you either through a provider that's caring for you, but also can be um, directly sent to you. It also offers comprehensive counseling and supportive care and for indications where it's needed, um, family testing, because we talked again, the importance of um, testing multiple family members. And for those of you who are interested, um, here's the website there. And then I think we have um, just a few more things before we go to a Q&A, but I'm going to um, give it back to either Emma or Brian. And thank you everybody for your attention and I will be available for a Q&A session. It's time to get into Q&A, everybody's favorite. All right, so first question. All right, Dr. Wu, can you re-explain the differences between type one and type two APDS? Yeah, that's a, um, a good question. So just to kind of re-review, um, as I mentioned, the PI3 kinase delta protein is like that lever at the beginning of the machine. And so if you were to put um, a magnifying glass onto that PI3 kinase delta protein, what you would see is it consists of kind of two building blocks. Um, there is a catalytic unit or what I like to think of as like the gas pedal for the PI3 kinase delta. And then there's um, a regulatory unit or the brake pedal. And the two are always paired together. So you have gas, brake, gas, brake. Um, for patients that have changes in the gene that encodes the gas pedal, um, so that gene is PIK3CD, um, those patients have um, APDS type 1. Um, for patients who have um, changes or variants in the gene that encodes the brake pedal, um, that gene is PIK3R1, they have APDS type 2. Um, either way, what we see is changes in the gas pedal um, allow it to accelerate too much, and then changes in the brake pedal don't allow it to do its job. Um, both result in too much activity in that PI3 kinase delta lever, um, cranking it into that on position. Um, so hopefully that helps. That was, that was a great explanation. Thank you. <laughs> that helped me. Um, all right, next question. Um, what is the youngest age documented in treatment for APDS? Um, I think it would depend on, I'm not sure specifically about treatment. Um, I will say that um, in the literature, as far as a known diagnosis or complication, um, probably around 18 months of age. Um, but I will tell you, like I mentioned at the early of reviewing the symptoms, and this is true for my patients I follow with APDS, most of these patients start to have symptoms um, even in infancy, like before they're one year of age. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, in the phase three trial of lenalisib, was combination therapy with IVIG also tested? And I was going to say, Brian might want to also come back for that one. <clears throat> Oh, he just popped up. Okay, never mind. We'll have uh, <laughs> we'll have Dr. Wu answer. Um, I'll, I'll I'll just repeat it just in case. In the face yes. of the trial of lenalisib, was combination therapy with IVIG also tested? Yeah, um, I wouldn't say it. I mean, to my understanding, it wasn't um, necessarily like purposely tested with IVIG, except you know, let me let me scoot back for that. So if 
patients were referred and were already on immunoglobulin replacement therapy as part of their management for APDS, they were kept on it. Um, but it wasn't like um, patients were, you know, set in this group to say, okay, they're going to get lenalisib and IVIG, and then these patients are only going to get lenalisib. They were continued on, for the most part, um, immunoglobulin replacement therapy if they were referred on, into the trial on it. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so this, I think, is kind of a follow-up question. So someone is asking, so both B cells and T cells are stuck in, an, in the immature state with APDS. Um, let me see. OK, OK, so um, yeah, so let me just um, restate the question. The question is, so B, t B cells and T cells are stuck in the immature state in APDS. And of course, the um, most simple answer is not necessarily, OK? <laughs> so when it comes to the B cells in particular, um, if you were to you know, look at the B cell compartment in those different stages of growth and development that I highlighted on that one slide, um, we can actually look to see how many different types of B cells there are in the different stages of growth and development. For B cells, it does appear that most of them seem to be stuck in this kind of um, immature um, stage and not able to do their job. For T cells, it's actually a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, when we look at the immature T cell compartment, um, they actually seem to be reduced in number. And instead, it's almost like um, the T cells are driven similar to the B cells where they have kind of this life cycle um, where I talked about newborn to cell death. Um, it's almost like the T cells are driven more towards this kind of um, like exhausted, mature form, but still not very functional. Um, so the takeaway is that the cells that are there, again, because of the unbalance and the different type of T and B cells that are there, they're not able to do their job of helping us to fight infections and get rid of germs from the body. Hey, apologize. I got kicked off. I, I'm back on now. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming back on. Um, all right. Thank you for that, Dr. Wu. Next question. Um, is there a specific sport program for APDS that patients can be a part of that provides specific information for APDS, something that links us to clinical trials, et cetera? Um, yes, I'm sorry. I just lost, I don't know what happened. Um, I lost my Zoom and I can't see you guys. Oh, no. But here we go. Okay, now oh. I can. Okay. Yes. So um, the resource slide that I had up and um, some of the resources that Emma mentioned at the beginning are all geared um, towards um, APDS and provide additional information in depth, lots of videos about um, APDS diagnosis, um, you know, the symptoms, the disease course, as well as the management. Thank you. Yes, and we'll also touch on some of those resources again as we wrap up. Great. Um, wonderful. Okay, next question. Also, thank you so much, everyone, for all these questions. They are great. Um, all right. If some patients start to show symptoms before age one, do you think APDS or other types of PI might be added to the newborn screening panel in the future like SCID is? Yeah, that's another um, excellent question. Um, so, as the person mentioned, um, for newborn screening, there's a type of primary immunodeficiency called severe combined immunodeficiency um, that has been added um, in part because it has a pretty easy uh, test that can help make the diagnosis early on. Um, SCID is also considered like uh, a health emergency. So the earlier you can diagnose these children um, and get them to transplant, um, the better the outcome. Um, for APDS, it's a little bit more complicated because as you, I, I reviewed on this couple of slides, you know, there are some blood tests that we look for and we can see some disturbances in some of the immune studies, but there's not a single diagnostic test um, that would fit well necessarily for a quick newborn screen. Thank you. 
Um, all right, next question. What trials are being conducted for medication? Um, so as far as um, trials for the treatment of um, APDS, I think as Brian mentioned, and I don't know if he wants to expand on, um, is lenalisib for APDS not yet approved, still investigational? Um, similarly, there are some other um, you know, PI3 kinase delta inhibitors that are also under study. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention about, because I mentioned about our phase three program. Unfortunately, at the moment, I can't provide any other comments or detail, details as the, the data is currently under review by the FDA. Thank you both. Um, all right. And follow up for that, how is the lineolacib administered and what is the youngest age for target? Yes. I can take that or Brian, you can either one. Yeah, well, you know, this again, unfortunately, just because of all this, this data is currently under review, I'm not able to kind of comment and provide uh, any of that, any of those details specifically from a data standpoint. All right, and our last question is, with potential early onset of GI symptoms, has there been any data to look at rationales, for example, unexplained C. diff at ages 18 to 24 months of age? Um, sorry, just helps me if I restate the question. So potential early onset of GI symptoms, um, any data to look at um, rationale, um, so for C. difficile. So first I'll, I think I'll divide this question up into two parts. So as far as the early um, onset of GI symptoms, um, you know, we think the rationale for that is um, oftentimes, you know, that lymphoproliferation that we talked about. And so these patients early on can get those islands of um, lymphoproliferation in the GI tract. Um, and that can cause a lot of GI um, symptoms early on in children, like we talked about chronic diarrhea, malabsorption, not growing well, either in weight or height. Um, when it comes to C. difficile colitis, I mean, that certainly has been described in APDS patients. I wouldn't say C. C difficile colitis is specific to APDS. Um, it isn't in the narrow spectrum of infections we see. There are a lot of um, risk factors for C. difficile colitis. So certainly if, you know, um, your gut microbiome immunology is not in balance and that might predispose you needing to be on multiple antibiotics to treat the other infections that we see with APDS could predispose you um, to C. difficile colitis. Um, so I think there could be uh, sort of multiple factors that might contribute to an APDS patient getting C. difficile colitis in, in early childhood. All right, great. And then do you, if you have time for a couple more questions, we did get a couple more. Um, sure. And then after these last two, we'll, we'll, we'll close it out. But thank you so much, everyone, for all your questions. It's been great. Mm, yes, they have been great. <laughs> um, all right. So what kind of autoimmune diseases are most likely to occur in APDS patients? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the probably the most common autoimmune complications are going to be those autoimmune cytopenias. So where um, you have the autoimmune hemolytic anemia, where immune system attacks your blood cells, causing you to be anemic, and that ITP or autoimmune thrombocytopenic purpura, um, where you have immune destruction of your platelets, which help you um, form clots and prevent bleeding. Thank you. Um, all right, and then someone else asked, can you only have one or two of the symptoms, for example, chronic diarrhea early, but not more of the severe symptoms? Um, yeah, that is another excellent question. And the short answer is yes. Um, you know, typically these patients tend to have more symptoms and more severe symptoms. But as I've mentioned before, there are outliers and it can be a spectrum. And though rare, there have also been reports of individuals who um, have a genetic change or genetic variant and may have very little or no symptoms. And so if you have a family member who's been affected and you have some minor symptoms, um, I certainly think it would be worthwhile pursuing um, additional immune testing and potentially genetic testing as well. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wu. That's going to wrap up Q&A. Um, again, thank you so much to our audience for all of your engagement and participation. We really appreciate you entering in your questions. So thank you. All right. Well, before we close, um, we hope that you'll remember to take advantage of all the resources that IDF has to offer. Um, to find our materials on APDS, you can visit our website and just search APDS in the search bar um, or visit the IDF Resource Center. We have educational videos of all of our past programs and presentations, countless resources, and um, tons of ways to connect with others in the PI community. I also want to draw your attention to this first link. Um, IDF recently put out a blog about the brand new diagnostic code for APDS, which is obviously a win in this world and um, will hopefully lead to, to more big things happening in the APDS world. So we're excited about that. Um, again, if you want to visit our APDS website, it's primaryimmune.org slash APDS. And then I've also included links to the IDF Resource Center and our support services. To our audience, um, if you have additional questions, you can ask IDF. Go online and submit your questions to Ask IDF by visiting primaryimmune.org slash ask-idf or give us a call at the number on your screen. We want to close by saying that all IDF programming is truly guided by the individuals and families we serve, um, and therefore we hope you'll take our very brief program evaluation survey, which we email out to everyone after the program. And um, we hope to see you at some of our upcoming programs in the next couple of weeks. We have a Lunch and Learn next week on B cell reconstitution and IgG therapy um, with our friends over at Cal SCID. And then also we have an ADA SCID gene therapy update with Dr. Cohn from UCLA coming up in September. Um, so we hope to see you at another IDF event soon. Um, I just wanna thank again, Dr. Wu so much, as well as our partners at Farming for supporting today's program. This was incredible. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. We had a great turnout with over 130 folks registered and we really appreciate you being a part of today's program. So thank you so much and we hope to see you at the next Lunch and Learn. And thank you again to our friends at Farming for supporting today's program.